Hey folks, welcome back. So this is a follow up video to our last video on contrastive loss. Uh, I would recommend watching that video or understanding the idea behind contrastive loss before uh, continuing on to this video, just because this is addressing a lot of the issues that we explained at the end of that video on what does contrastive loss miss? And therefore, why is it necessary to do something more complicated, which in this case is called triplet loss. In general, in math or stats or data science, anytime we're considering a more complicated thing, we should always start from what is wrong with the more simple thing. Otherwise, we should just use the more simple thing to start with. So I'm just going to borrow the same example from that video, which was you are running a top secret lab and it's so top secret that I can't even explain what the secrets are in this video, but you want to make sure that only authorized personnel are able to enter your lab. So you mount a video camera to the top of the lab door, you take a picture of anyone trying to get in, and if the embedding of that picture, which is learned by your model, is close enough to the embedding of somebody who is authorized to enter the lab, then you go ahead and let them in, otherwise you don't let them in. And so it's important for whatever loss function we use to have the property that embeddings for pictures of the same person end up close to each other in the embedding space, and embeddings for pictures of people who are different end up in faraway points different from each other in the embedding space. And using that, we in the last video talked about here's contrastive loss, which somewhat achieves that goal. So as a recap, this looks slightly complicated, but basically it's just saying if y, which is a binary variable who says if two pictures are the same person, if that's equal to one, then we're simply just saying loss is the distance between those embeddings squared, which makes sense because we want to decrease that distance between those embeddings as much as possible, given they're from the same person. However, if the embeddings are from uh, different people's pictures, then y would be zero, and we would just have this term here, which is prioritizing those distances being far apart up to some margin m. If it's further than that margin, we don't really care, as long as they're at least m distance apart. Now, we said that the main issue was that contrastive loss is context unaware. We did that by looking at hard negatives and hard positives, and in both cases, we were looking at a trio of examples. And we didn't give them names at the end of that last video, but now we're ready to give them names in the same terminology used when you'll see any kind of explanation on triplet loss, one being the anchor. You can think of this as the ego or the main point we're focusing on. In other words, put yourself in the shoes of the anchor training example when we're telling the story. The other two are relative to the anchor. One is called positive, which is an example of the same class as the anchor. So in our example here, that's going to mean that it's the same person. It's a picture of the same person. Notice that in this positive example here, this person's changed their hairstyle up a little bit, but they're fundamentally the same person, and so the anchor and the positive belong to the same class. The negative is exactly the opposite of that, as the name might suggest. It's explicitly a picture of a person from a different class. So we see that this is a different person altogether, and therefore relative to the anchor, this is our negative case. And triplet loss, unlike contrastive loss, which operates on pairs of examples, is going to operate on these trios, on these anchor positive negative examples. And its goal is similar to the goal we stated for contrastive loss, but it is slightly different in a way that's going to address better those hard negative and hard positives that we had in the previous video. The goal of triplet loss stated in one sentence is that given an anchor positive and negative, the negative example should be at least, should be at least a distance m further away from the anchor than the positive example. So that is a little bit tricky to understand. I want to make sure that we fully understand this sentence and we can do that through this picture here because once we understand the sentence, that's going to make understanding the math that comes next and the formula for triplet loss way easier. So again, we have our anchor here, we have our positive example here, and we have our negative example here. Now let's say that at some point during the training, we have that the distance between our anchor and our positive example is given by this line here. So let me go ahead and grab a marker of a different color here so I can highlight things. So the distance between the anchor and the positive, let's say, is this much here. Now the distance between the anchor and the negative is going to be given by this line segment here. And so what do we care about? What we care about is not directly either of these line segments, but rather the difference in distance between these line segments. Namely, we see that that difference in distance in this example is exactly that margin m, which is labeled here and labeled here. But how I got that is basically taking this full distance to the negative 
and subtracting off this distance to the positive. And what I'm left with is that the differential or the additional distance away that the negative example is from the anchor versus the positive example is this m. And that's exactly pictorially encoding the same thing we encoded word-wise or verbally here, which is that the negative example, negative example, should be at least m further, should be at least m further from the anchor than the positive example is. So you can hopefully see now these are encoding the same idea. But what is that idea and how do we state it more obviously? The idea is basically that, hey, I want my loss to prioritize separating examples of different classes by a margin of at least m. In other words, if I am the anchor, then if I have another example here who is some distance away, I want to make sure that no matter how far that is away, whether that's very, very close to me, literally, or kind of further from me, literally, I want to make sure that the negative example, who definitely should not be close to me, is also not close to the positive example. It's at least an m additional distance away from the positive example. And what we're trying to prioritize here is separation of the classes, is trying to make sure that we have all the embeddings for one class maybe here. Perhaps that's a tight cluster, perhaps it's not so much of a tight cluster if the model is struggling with it, as we saw with hard positives and hard negatives. But no matter how tight or how loose that structure is, we want to make sure that the other structure, the other cluster of embeddings for a different class, is at least a distance of m away from that first cluster. We're trying to get an optimal structure of the embedding space. Whereas contrastive loss was very narrowly focused on here's one example, here's another example, I either want them to be close or I want them to be far up to a certain degree. That might work for very naive use cases, but in many real world use cases where we are dealing with hard positives and hard negatives and the whole problem is more challenging, what we might actually care about and what I might be constructive to think about is making sure that the classes are separated by a margin of at least m and that might give us better results. Now, how do we take that idea, both verbally, we explained it pictorially, and we kind of talked through it here, how do we explain that mathematically? And that's what we're going to do in this next page here. So this was kind of stated implicitly, but I want to make it very explicit because it's kind of unlike other machine learning problems you might have worked on, where each training example was just a single instance, or in contrastive loss, it was two instances that we're trying to compare. In triplet loss, we go one step further. Each training example consists of three instances in our training data. One of them, again, is called the anchor or the ego. Put yourself in the shoes of this example. One is the positive, whose class should be the same as the anchor, and one is the negative, whose class should explicitly be different from that of the anchor. So we kind of just usually denote those as A, P, and N. Now, what does triplet loss look like? This is the mathematical form of it. It looks a little bit scary, but I'm going to explain exactly what's going on. It's going to be taking the maximum of zero and this term here. This term being the distance between the anchor and the positive, minus the distance between the anchor and the negative, plus our margin m. And I think the best way to understand what the heck this is doing is just to plot it out. So on this plot, on the x-axis, I have this term here, which is distance AP minus distance AN. In other words, it is the differential of the distance from the anchor and the positive to the anchor and the negative. So it's exactly that line segment there. It's actually the negative of that because we're taking this AP distance and we're subtracting off the AN distance. And so it is encoding that distance right here. So encoding that additional distance away from the anchor. And that's exactly what you're seeing on the X axis here. Now let's do a couple of cases to get a feel for what is going on and why that is going on. Let's say that this differential distance is less than negative M. If it's less than negative m, then when I add m to that, I'm still gonna have a negative number. Taking the max of zero and a negative number is going to give me zero. That's why on this whole region here, where we have this quantity less than negative m, we have a loss, a triplet loss of zero. And why does that make sense? Well, let's think about what that means. If this quantity here on the x-axis is very negative, is sufficiently negative, then what that means is that the negative example is at least m units of distance further away from the anchor than the positive example is from the anchor. And that's exactly the good case that we want. That means that looking at these triplets, they are well separated. Well separated meaning that the negative is sufficiently far from the anchor relative to how close the positive is to the anchor. 
And I want to just pause here and say this, the telling of the story of talking about anchors and positives and negatives is exactly adding the context that we were missing when we were talking about contrastive loss, which is just able to talk about the anchor and the positive or the anchor and the negative. Here we're saying, I have the anchor and I have something similar to it and I have something different from it. And I want to tell a story where I talk about all three of these things at once. And that's where the power of triplet loss comes in. So going back to our case here, that makes sense why we would have no loss here because that's a good case for us. Now there's two more logical areas of this diagram we should talk about. So that's one logical area, anything less than M, negative M. Another logical area is going to be where the distance is negative but still greater than negative M. In that case, we do know that the negative case is further away from the anchor than the positive case, but the margin is not exactly where we want it to be. The margin is still less than M. And so we want to give a little bit of loss in that case so that the model as it continues training should hopefully learn to increase that margin because it is still getting a positive loss. And the model would love to get a zero loss there. So this is a kind of mid case where we do kind of get what we want. The positive is closer to the anchor than the negative, but we could do a little bit better. We want to do that more comfortably. And so we want the margin to be bigger there. And the last logical case is anything positive. So what does it mean if this quantity here is positive? then that is actually worst case scenario because that means that the distance between the anchor and the positive is actually bigger than the distance between the anchor and the negative and that's not good because that means that the embedding for the anchor and something that's not in the same class as the anchor those are actually for some reason closer to each other than the embedding for the anchor and something that is like the anchor and so we want to give a positive a positive loss that increases as that gap gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And so hopefully now you see mathematically and also through this graph here why this mathematical equation is encoding exactly is encoding exactly what we talked about on the last page both pictorially and verbally. And so folks in a nutshell that is what triplet loss is doing. The power and the key addition of triplet loss on top of something like contrastive loss is that we're able to look at these triplets all at once and are able to tell some kind of story about how well do we consider the current state of those embeddings uh, relative to each other, rather than just looking at A and P or just looking at A and N. And so that is the power of triplet loss. And to get a really concrete sense of how using triplet loss solves the problems with hard negatives and hard positives that we saw with contrastive loss, let's actually go ahead and just revisit those two scenarios from the last video. So the first scenario was where we have a hard negative in the bottom case here versus where we don't have a hard negative in the top case here. We saw that contrastive loss is not going to care because it's just going to look at A1 and A2 and say, hey, they're from the same class and therefore I'm going to take A2 and make it closer to A1. Triplet loss actually will make a different decision in this scenario because it's going to go ahead and look at the top scenario and say, hey, if my anchor is A1, my positive is A2, and my negative is C, then if the margin between A2 and C is already sufficiently big, then there's no additional incentive for me to move A2 closer to A1. And thereby we avoid the problem of all of the embeddings for a given person just kind of collapsing on the same point in the embedding space, which is not really what we want. Conversely, it looks at the bottom case here where C does become hard negative, and we see that the margin between A2 and C is now too small. And so for using triplet loss, the model will be forced to move A2 closer to A1 in this case in order to make that gap between A2 and C bigger. So it does make a more contextually aware, good decision in this case to deal with these hard negatives. And very similarly, if we look at our example from last video of hard positives, if we look at this initial case where we're asking if we should move the embedding for C further away from the embedding for A1, contrastive loss would say no because it's already further than the margin, and triplet loss would say the same thing because if we look at the distance between A2 and C, that margin is also sufficiently large. So it'll make the same decision as contrastive loss made, and that is arguably the correct decision. If we now make A2 a hard positive, as we did before, we recall that contrastive loss would still do nothing to C because the margin between A1 and C is still larger than M. There's no action to be taken. But we see that if we use triplet loss, then now the margin between A2 and C, in other words, the margin between the positive and the negative, is now too small for comfort. We're not happy with that small of a margin anymore. And therefore, we do now have incentive to move C further away. And so we see from these two cases that triplet loss is able to deal with hard positives and hard negatives in a way that contrastive loss just was not able to. Now, we talked about so far the great, 
part of triplet loss and what it adds on top of contrastive loss, but also we should probably talk about the complications that triplet loss uh, brings to the problem. Because anytime you have something more complicated or something that's trying to solve a previous problem, chances are you're also introducing some new nuances that we should talk about. The most obvious of those is the added computational complexity here. So we now have to deal with triplets of examples instead of pairs of examples. Pairs of examples are just easier to talk about, triplets are more difficult to talk about, but besides just how easy it is to talk about them, we also add some computational complexity. There, the space of possible pairs, given all your training examples, is, in terms of cardinality, much smaller than the pairs of possible triplets that we're talking about. And so what it becomes really important to do, especially if you're trying to keep your training data the same size, whether using pairs or triplets, it becomes really important when you're using triplet loss to do very intelligent what's called triplet mining, which is just a fancy way of saying picking triplets that are going to help your model learn. Because when the space of something gets larger, you usually need to get a lot better at figuring out which examples in that space, so which triplets in this case, are actually going to be helpful in helping my model learn versus which are not helpful at all in helping my model learn. And so these are just some, um, some things to keep in mind about how to do triplet mining, but triplet mining itself is a whole art and science that we could do a whole video or set of videos on. Uh, so these are not complete, but at least they can help you get started in how to pick good triplets if you choose to use triplet loss to train the embeddings in your problem. So one of these things here is avoid redundant triplets. Redundant triplets are those who already have zero loss. So for example, cases where the negative is already much further away from the anchor than the positive. Feeding that into your example is not really going to help it learn because it already has a loss of zero. So there's not really anything further that we can learn from that. Another thing that we actually want to include is prioritizing hard triplets. Hard triplets are typically those that we can think of in this region three that we talked about last where for whatever reason, the negative is actually closer to the anchor than the positive is. That's bad, but it's also quite interesting because we might want the model to focus very much on those in order to help it learn from the most egregious problems that we have at any point during our training. So prioritizing hard triplets, and then also to a lesser extent, prioritizing semi-hard triplets. Semi-hard triplets just being a fancy way of saying the things that are in this middle category we talked about here, where Yes, the positive is closer to the anchor than the negative is to the anchor, but not by the margin that we want it to be. So we're still a little bit uncomfortable about those and probably want the model to learn from those. So there's much more to be said again about triplet mining, but the key idea I want to get across is that we need to do some kind of smart sampling and triplet mining when we choose to use triplet loss. And that's just a downside or something we have to keep in mind if we want the power that comes with triplet loss. Now I think that's most of what I wanted to say. The last thing that I'll say here is many of you might have seen a pattern here. We use contrastive loss which used two examples and we said that works in some cases but has these problems. Then we use triplet loss which takes in three examples and we said that fixes the problems of contrastive loss to some degree but of course that may not be enough. What's to stop us from using four examples or five examples or more? And that's a very natural extension and a great way to think. In fact, there are papers out there that use uh, quadruplet loss or quintuplet loss. But for the most part, it seems like folks have kind of settled on using triplet loss because when you think about those quadruplet or quintuplet loss, yes, that may give you even better learning of your embeddings and an even better structure of the embedding space, but all these problems just become magnified. The combinatorial explosion of the number of quadruplets that are out there, or the number of quintuplets that are out there, might just be too big and it might lead to computational inefficiencies of even figuring out how to mine quadruplets or mine quintuplets. So, uh, for better or worse, right now where we're at is that triplets are typically what we talk about. Um, the most we talk about are triplets, but that may change. There may be some kind of cornerstone paper that comes out that says, hey, this is a really smart way to do quadruplet mining. But hopefully this video gave you an idea of triplet loss, which I do think is one of the coolest types of loss out there because it's the only loss function that I really know of that's mainstream that takes in three examples and it does it in such an interesting way where we're trying to cluster these two together while making sure the margin between the positive and the negative is high. It's so intuitive, but also something that addresses the problems with its predecessors. So if you like this video, please like and subscribe for more videos just like this. Any comments are always welcome in the section below and I'll see all you wonderful, wonderful people next time.